Well, good morning. I'd like to thank everybody for getting here so early. And I apologize. Well, I was supposed to talk yesterday, but I was supposed to be out of town yesterday, but as it ended up, I, I was here. But I'm really happy to be able to talk to everybody today. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about today, as it says, is my basic interest is population genetics. And most of my work has been trying to apply the principles of population genetics to problems in conservation. And as it was mentioned in my introduction, I forgot that I put that in my little bio, that I guess my overall research philosophy has been that some of the most basic, interesting basic questions in science are also most important questions for conservation. And this is, I think, especially true when it comes to invasive species. I mean, there's lots of really interesting problems trying to understand genetics and evolution from studying invasive species that also have great practical application. So these are just a couple of papers that I've written over the years on invasive species. The bottom one, the population biology of invasive species, that was a group funded, brought together by NSF, trying to get a bunch of basic scientists to think about the problems with invasive species. And my own research with invasive species has been with rainbow trout, and I'd like to thank Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. I was sitting down trying to think. So this work has been funded in, in collaboration with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks over the years. So I was sitting down trying to think how many years. It's actually been 40 years that we've been working on this problem in collaboration with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And so hatchery rainbow trout, as everybody knows, have been introduced, well, throughout the world. They're literally in every continent except Antarctica. And here in Montana, they've been a big problem because they hybridize and produce fertile hybrids with both the native West Slope cutthroat trout and the native Yellowstone cutthroat trout. So today I'd like to talk about three different things, how we can use genetics to detect the establishment and spread of invasive species, about how understanding and adaptive evolution can be important for managing invasions, and finally, a little bit about different techniques that are out there that are possible for genetic eradication and control. So I'll start with number one, you, how do we use genetics to establish or to detect the establishment and spread of species? And so this is a, a, a figure from one of my papers thinking about uh, endangered species, and so propagule pressure, so individuals are introduced, and on the, on the left you can introduce more fewer or more individuals, and from a genetic perspective, what is important in terms of getting established or, and then eventually spreading is how many individuals are introduced and how many different source populations are introduced. And it turns out this is one of those problems which is important from a, trying to understand basic genetics and evolution and also important for endangered species. It turns out that when more individuals are introduced, when there's more genetic variation in that initial propagule, the invasive species are, are more likely to be successful. And there's a numbers, number of papers out there looking at the effect of the number of individuals introduced and how successful the, the spread, the invasive. I guess successful is not the right word. It's sort of backwards, but how, how successful the species are in becoming uh, invasive. And the second point is number of source populations. And so very often there are multiple populations which are introduced in the initial propagule, and it turns out that having multiple populations is also very important. And the more, when there are more populations introduced, endangered or in introduced species are more likely to become invasive. And hybridization, there's a lot of work out there now showing that a lot of the most problematic invasive species have a hybrid origin, especially in plants. Many of the, 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 the plants which are most problematic in terms of being invasive turn out to be hybrids. With our own work, so we've worked on hybridization, again, spread of rainbow trout hybridization with cutthroat trout. And it's really interesting People sometimes say, well, if there really is reduced fitness, then we don't have to worry about hybridization because natural selection will remove them. Well, as it turns out, a lot of work by Clint Mulfeld, Ryan Kovach, uh, Gordon Lucart, other people working in association with me, hybrids actually have lower fitness. 
So if you measure the number of progeny they produce, it's much fewer than the native trout. However, hybrids are also much more likely to disperse. So even though they have lower fitness within the stream, hybridization still spreads because the hybrids are more likely to move around. So hybridization can be a, a real stimulus and a real problem in invasive species. And so this is just a nice little story of you, how we can use genetics to get at some questions in invasive species. So I've spent a lot of time in New Zealand, and New Zealand has no native terrestrial mammals except for bats, but the stoats and mice and rats have been introduced. So New Zealand spends a lot of time trying to remove these, in, these mammals from some of the islands, offshore islands. And so these are a couple of islands that are uh, off of the North Island from, from uh, Auckland. And what they did was they went out and they removed all the stoats, the uh, mustelid, uh, from, the, from two islands which are near Auckland. They completely removed them by, by poisoning. And then they found a stoat back on the island. And so then the question was, well, is that somebody that they missed, or was that a stoat that liked to swim from the mainland and got out to the island? And so they, what they did was they looked at a, a bunch of the genotypes of the individuals who had been on the island before the eradication. They looked at the mainland, and they looked at the invader. And this is just a plot. The triangles are the genotypes on this th multi-dimensional plot of the genotypes of the individuals that were on the island before eradication. The circles are the genotypes of the individuals from the mainland. And then the unknown is the open diamond down there in the middle. So the genotype of that individual matched the, the mainland population. So he was not an animal that was missed, but he was an animal that swam from the mainland back out to the island. And so there was a lot of papers yesterday talking about environmental DNA, and uh, so I'm not going to be talking about environmental DNA. You got your, you heard a lot of, about that yesterday, but I've become enamored with Psycoos, which are scientific haikus, and this is a Psycoo written by Taylor Wilcox, who works in the genomics lab over in the Forest Service that you all heard about yesterday. So a drop of water in it is eDNA, genes from all life there. So, and this is one of my favorite stories about using sort of uh, DNA, env environmental DNA. So I spent a lot of time in Western Australia, and I actually, that the sticker up top, I actually took a picture of that on a bus, and as shown below. And so they actually have threatened people that if you spit on their bus, they will collect the spit and identify the DNA. And I would be willing to bet they've never collected any DNA, and the drivers never used it, but... It's still a, a nice story of the potential things we can do with, with using environmental DNA. So the second thing I'd like to talk about is effects of adaptive evolution during invasions. And this is important from an evolutionary biologist perspective. As Theodosius Dobjansky, the famous quote that probably everybody has heard, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So this is Dobjansky getting the National Medal of Science from President Johnson. So it's really hard to believe. So this was in, 19, well, obviously in the 1960s. So it's really hard to believe, imagining our current president giving an evolutionary biologist a, a medal, but <laughs> ignoring that. So, and so what Dobjansky was getting at, this is my favorite example of that. So why do human feces smell so bad? And if you think about it, it, they, they don't, it doesn't smell bad to all animals. Dogs like to eat it. Lots of other animals like it. So why does human feces smell so bad to us? Any, any ideas? Say that again. Because we eat terrible stuff. No, even if we eat good stuff, I think it smells. Yes, exactly. So if you, you can imagine people, when they're before there were toilet facilities, there may be human feces around, so you have little children playing, and if it smelled pretty good, maybe they would play with it and put it in their mouth. 
And if they did that, they would be le much less likely to grow up and, and reproduce. So there's been strong selection for avoiding human feces. And so the only way we can understand things like why shit smells is trying to understand evolution. And, and this has been a real problem when people have tried to use control on different, different pests or invasive species. So bed bugs is a great example of this. Bed bugs is now a real problem in a lot of hotels around the world, where for years it was controlled by DDT and other pesticides. But what happens when you use DDT or other pesticides on, on a, something like a, a bed bug? So on the left and the bottom, you have your original population. You have some individuals who are susceptible and some who are resistant, let's say, to DDT. And so then you kill all the ones that are sensitive, and the ones that remain are the ones that are resistant. So when those individuals reproduce, we get a new population which, which has much higher resistance. And if we look back from when DDT was first used in 1946, it didn't take long, and DDT and, and other pesticides, it didn't take long. So this is a number of resistant species starting at zero in 1940, going up, well, this slide only goes to about 2005, over 500 resistant species to all these pesticides. So life is a moving target, and if we try to use pesticides or other means of control, adaptive evolution may work around what we're trying to do in terms of control. And so this is one of those places where basic science and applied science come together. There's been a lot of really interesting work from a basic perspective on adaptive evolution and in invasive species and trying to understand how this adaptation could be important for spread of inv invasive species and potentially how it can be understanding it is important for control. So this was a slide we looked at before, and so the, 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 before I talk about the number of founders and number of source populations, but the other thing is once a population is established, natural selection and evolution is going to occur. And so one of the explanations for the lag time that we often see be, between when a species gets established and when it really becomes a, a, a pest is adaptation which is going on in terms of becoming more adapted to the, the new environment. So understanding adaptation is important for understanding invasive species. And this is a paper that came out a couple of years ago. So if we're using biological control agents to try to control invasive species, evolution can, can have an effect. So this was a, an, another example in New Zealand where there was a weevil that was a pest in, agricultural pest in New Zealand. So they introduced a parasitic wasp. And initially, so this is this plot, the y-axis is the number, the parasitism rates, the x-axis is the years after first introduction of the, the parasitoid. And so it goes out to about 24 years. So when the wasp was first introduced, the parasitism rate was 70%. It was very successful. But over the years, you can see almost a linear decline in the success, so that after 24 years, only 10% of the weevils were parasitized. So if we're going to use these kinds of control measures, we, have to, we should be doing them in the way that is going to minimize the possibility of a species become adapted to whatever the control measure is that we're using. And I like this one just because it's such a, a wonderful picture. And so as everybody knows, probably cane toads are invasive species in Australia. And as they spread across Australia, cane toads have a venom, or excuse me, uh, they have, a, what's the, toxins, thank you, thank you. And so snakes that eat cane toads are likely many of them die, and so this is work done by Ben Phillips and, and Dick, Rick Schein looking at, well, one thing they've looked at is there's actually been selection. If you look in places where the cane toad is now and has been for a while, the snakes actually have smaller jaws, and the idea is that snakes with large jaws can swallow a cane toad, but the snakes with smaller jaws cannot. Cannot. So there's been selection for small against individuals who are able to eat cane toads. And then if you look in the, the upper plot there on the left, 
That is whether or not, if you give snakes the choice between having a frog or a toad, those that come from populations where the cane toads have been, have been for a long time will, are less likely, on this they won't eat any of the toads at all, they'll only eat the frogs, or if you go to places where the cane toad hasn't been, the snakes will eat both the, the toads or the frogs. And then if you look at the effect of the toxin on the bottom, this is the proportion of, of reduction in speed. So if you feed them cane toads and then measure how fast they can move, individuals who are from populations which have been exposed to the cane toad are less affected by, by the toxin itself. So there's selection going on as the cane toads spread across Australia. So the final thing I want to talk about is genetic eradication and control. So how can we use genetics directly to reduce the, the spread? And so the number of people, m number of people have thought about this problem from a genetic perspective. And one thing is trying to use in invasive plants using what are called selfish genetic elements. And so these are alleles which cause male sterility. And these are very common, as it says here, over 150 plant species these have been found in. And so if we can increase the frequency of these in plant populations, we can perhaps reduce the, the effectiveness of invasive plants. And mitochondrial DNA, so is a, uh, everybody in this room has mitochondrial DNA in their mitochondria. Most of our genetic materials in the nucleus, so there's about three billion base pairs in our nucleus, but there's about 15 to 20,000 in the mitochondria. And the mitochondrial DNA is inherited only from our mother, so this is just a, a brief pedigree. So circles in a pedigree, circles are the females, and the squares are the males. So in this example, we have two different genetic types of mitochondria called one and two, and if you look at the, so the first generation is at the top, and you look at the next generation, the individuals in that generation have the same mitochondrial gene type as their mother. Their father's mitochondrial DNA has, has no effect whatsoever. So we get all of our mitochondrial DNA from our mother. And the example in plants, so there are many alleles that cause the fertility in males that are carried in the mitochondrial DNA of plants. We can do actually the same, very analogous thing in, in animals, and so sperm are modal and powered by mitochondria. And so if we, there are mutations in animal mitochondrial DNA that reduce male fertility because their, their sperm won't, will not function, but it has no effect, it, the effect is small enough that it has no effect on the, on the soma or on the female itself. So there are many, not many, there's a number of examples of mitochondrial DNA mutations in animals which reduce male fertility but have no effect on the female. And so this can also potentially be used for invasive species. And so this is some work I, I did, we did a long time ago trying to think about, so what happens if we have this mitochondrial mutation which only affects males and does not affect females? Well, since the mitochondria is passed on by the female, there won't be any selection against this mitochondrial type. So there won't be any natural selection because male, excuse me, female fitness will be the same no matter what mitochondrial type it has. But there's evidence that some of these, if they reduce the effectiveness slightly, will increase male infertility. So people have suggested that what they call the Trojan female technique so if we introduce females that have slightly defective mitochondrial DNA, and then they pass this on to their sons, we may reduce the fertility and the reproductive potential of the population by this kind of, of introduction. So uh, this is just what I said before, showing that here again we have another pedigree, and here we have males that, let's say that this these males are infertile, they don't die, but they're infertile, and it doesn't really matter in terms of the freq future frequency of the mitochondrial type, since males don't pass on their mitochondria anyhow, only through the females. So, and now, probably people have here heard about CRISPR, 
which is a way that we can inject genes, or not inject, but we can get genes introduced into the genome of individuals, and there are ways that we can do this, what's called gene drive, where these genes that we introduce will become very common in the population. And so CRISPR is being used in, in potentially in medicine, and it's also been suggested it can be used in endangered species. So if we introduce harmful alleles into a population, we may be able to better control that population. Of course, the problem is that if we introduce something that reduces the fitness or the, the, the viability of the population, there's always a possibility that somehow this may get back to the native range, and so it could cause problems in where this particular species is, is native. And here, this is actually a paper that just came out within the last few weeks, looking at ways that we can use CRISPR and what's called, well, again, gene drives. So on the left, there's two examples of spreading strongly harmful alleles in invasive populations. So by introducing these alleles, we may be able to control rats and, and mice in New Zealand in this example. And also, it's, they're trying to use it for controlling mosquitoes in, in Hawaii, which is spreading malaria that's affecting Hawaiian birds. Similar to that, we can potentially inject mildly deleterious, mildly harmful alleles into populations. And we may not be able to eradicate the population, but we may be able to reduce its effectiveness as an a, as a invasive species. And that's all I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have one brief comment, though. So this is a, a picture by John Ashley, who's a good friend of mine, who does a lot of night sky work. And he, if anybody's interested in buying some beautiful pictures of a nice sky in Glacier National Park, I recommend you go to the, the artist shop downtown. This is actually a picture of the North Fork of the Flathead River where we've done a lot of work with our invasive rainbow trout. So thanks, be happy to answer questions. I would really appreciate your just personal comments about CRISPR use. I know you just kind of presented it as something happening. Um, but just to go a little further into that, because it is such a hot topic, and those of us that are not geneticists would love to hear your thoughts. Well, that's a good question, because you're exactly right. I just presented it as something that is out there. And, I guess I tend to be more cautious than confident that it's going to be useful. I think there's problem, there, there are many problems. One problem is getting it to work at all, and the other problem is even if we get it to work, natural selection adaptation may work around it anyhow. So I have my, my personally, I, I have real doubts about it. And I know people that I interact with who know more about it than I, I think some of them have been really excited about it, and then when they've looked into it, they've become less excited about it. And these are completely different people, completely different situations. So I guess I, I would fall on the side of being more cautious. Because I'm afraid it wouldn't work, and even if it does work, it may cause more problems than it solves. Thank you, Fred, for the talk. Um, you stated earlier on that over the past 40 years, you, you've built a very successful interaction with, with the state. I was wondering if we could maybe highlight some of the, uh, um, I guess, tactics you and managers have taken over that 40-year period to really help transfer you know, what you've done via research into applied management. <laughs> Summarize 40 years in. Well, you know, I, I'm not a fish manager, so what we've done is provided the genetic expertise that, al that allows them to deal with these problems. And I guess the first thing, thinking about this standing on my feet, is just detection. And so it's very hard, as you know, looking at a fish, it's very hard to tell if it 
if it's a, a hybrid or it's a rainbow trout or it's a West Slope cutthroat trout. So I guess the first thing that we've done is allow them to detect where there is hybridization going on and try to detect that early when there may only be a, a small proportion of it. So try to, so that it can be dealt with it in that regard. The second thing is, is looking at, okay, so we, you can detect it, but what are the effects of it? So I think sometimes people, as I said, say, well, so what, what's wrong with hybridization? You know, if there, if there are so many hybrids out there, they must be doing well. Well, Ryan Kovach's work and Clint Mulfeld's work shows that hybrids have something, a, 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 a hybrid has about, let's say an F1, not an F1, but a hybrid, which is about 50% rainbow trout, 50% West Slope cutthroat trout, has about 20% the fitness of a pure West Slope cutthroat trout. And so there is reduced fitness, so it is reducing the productivity of, of these populations. And as I said, the reason that it continues to spread, as far as we can tell, one reason is because the hybrids are more, are more likely to, to move. So that, that, that's another thing, I guess, in the, and one way is, another thing is sort of, is removing populations. So we did a lot of work up in the Jewel Basin where they went in, looked at all the lakes, saw which ones had native fish, which ones had hybrids, and then wrote known the lake and re removed the introduced fish and, and, and planted them back out. So it, it's, it's complicated, as you know. I guess the main thing is you can't, you can't deal with the problem unless you know where the problem is, and that's the first thing, and then understanding that, yes, this really is a problem. Any other questions?